Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. My name is Jonathan Mavroidis. I'm with the Richard Nixon Foundation. Um, welcome, again, welcome to the Nixon Presidential Library. Uh, last year, we opened the new Nixon Library in spectacular fashion, and the reinvigorated new library with 70 new interactive galleries uh, has enjoyed scores of new visitors this past year, including school children as well as people from all around the world. Uh, with, with the new library now open, we are now engaged in an ambitious effort to establish the foundation and library as a center and beacon for scholarship, civic education, and outreach. Uh, we'll soon be launching a fellowship program with Chapman University's master program in Warren Society, Society and starting this fall, one State Department a Foreign Service officer and U.S. military officer will be selected from a group of distinguished candidates to study for one fully funded year at Chapman University and complete their master's thesis on an aspect of President Nixon's grand strategy in foreign policy using the vast collection of primary materials from the Nixon Presidential Library. Uh, keeping with President Nixon's commitment to the veterans of the armed forces, uh, we will also be working with uh, Camp Pendleton to help military veterans who gave so much for our country to find meaningful work in civilian life. Um, as well as that, we're keeping an active schedule of lectures, discussions, and debates and we're planning a conference this year to discuss the current state of environmental policies uh, that President Nixon enacted in the 1970s, uh, as well as two more panels on foreign policy, specifically the state of U.S.-China relations, uh, which the 37th president forged more than 45 years ago. Uh, now to introduce our distinguished panel. Thomas Finger is the Shorenstein APRC Fellow and was the inaugural Oxenberg Roland Fellow in the Freeman, at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. Uh, he was the Payne Distinguished Lecturer at Stanford during, uh, during January to December 2009, and from May 2005 through 2008, he served as the first Deputy Director of National Intelligence for Analysis and concurrently as Chairman of the National Intelligence Council. He served previously as Assistant Secretary of the State uh, Bureau of Intelligence and Research, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Analysis, Director of the Office of Analysis for East Asia and the Pacific, and Chief of the China Division. David Holloway is the Raymond Spruce Professor of International History, a Professor, a professor of Political Science and an FSI Senior Fellow. He was, he was Co-Director of CISAAC from 1991 to 1997 and director of FSI from 98 to 2003. His research focuses on the international history of nuclear weapons, on science and technology in the Soviet Union, and on the relationship between international history and international relations theory. His book, Stalin and the Bomb, the Soviet Union uh, and Atomic Energy, was chosen by the New York Times Review as one of the 11 best books of 1994 and it won the Vucinovich and Shulman Prizes of the American Association for the Advancement of Slavic studies. Carl Eikenberry is the Oxenberg Roland Fellow, the Director of US Asia Security Initiative and faculty member at the Shorenstein Pacific Research Center, Stanford University. He is a Stanford University professor of practice and an affiliate at the FSI Center for Democracy Development and Rule of Law, Center for International Security Cooperation, and the European Center. Prior to, prior to his arrival at Stanford, he served as the US Ambassador to Afghanistan from 2009 to 2011, where he led the civilian surge directed by President Obama to reverse insurgent, moment, insurgent momentum and set the conditions for a transition to full Afghan sovereignty. Catherine Stoner, who will moderate the program this evening, is a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, uh, also at Stanford, and at, the, uh, um, and at the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law uh, as well as international policy studies at Stanford University. She teaches in the Department of Political Science at Stanford and in the Program for International Relations and the Ford Dorsey Program. Prior to coming at Stanford in 2004, she was appointed on the faculty of Princeton University for nine years and was jointly appointed for the Department of Politics at the Woodrow Wilson Affairs for International, or for the Inter Woodrow Wilson School for International and Public Affairs. Uh, tonight's topic is about the triangular relations between relations between the US, China, and Russia, the world's great powers. And we thought it would be appropriate 
to hear President Nixon's voice and views on this matter 45 years ago. Uh, the clip you're about to hear is from the Nixon White House, White House tapes. Um, and this is President Nixon talking to his national security advisor, uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger, in January of 1972, just a month before the historic trip to China uh, that February. We are fighting against the Constitution. Before we start the program, I just wanted to introduce a special guest in our audience today, uh, the President Nixon's younger brother, uh, Ed Nixon. And with that, Dr. Stoner, the stage is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Mr. Nixon, for having us here. Um, we had a wonderful tour this afternoon of uh, the library, um, and I know we all enjoyed it very much. Um, I'm going to start our discussion by um, picking up uh, on uh, the tape that Jonathan just played for us, um, which was Nixon's idea of formulating friendly relations with China to counterbalance Soviet power um, in, uh, in the early 1970s. And he turned out to be very prescient in terms of uh, not worrying about China necessarily in 1972, but worrying about China uh, farther down the road. And so we find ourselves now in 2017 in an interesting and new situation where both China and Russia uh, are important to the United States in global affairs. Um, and since uh, Mr. Nixon was, was president of the United States, of course, and opened relations again with China, uh, rather infamously, um, we've had the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. We've had uprisings in uh, Tiananmen Square, of course, in 1989. We've had the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. We've had a period of uh, uh, weak Russia through the 1990s under Boris Yeltsin as it struggled to recover from both the trauma of 70 years of communism and uh, the rather unexpected um, and sudden collapse of communism. We have uh, 15 successor states as a result, uh, including Russia, um, who are forging their own global relationships and partnerships. Um, and in 2000, Russia began a rather dramatic recovery economically, um, and Mr. Putin came into office and has proclaimed that Russia is once again a great power of power to be reckoned with. In 2014, Russia um, in, seized, or if from their perspective, took back Crimea and the Crimean Peninsula, um, have been sanctioned as a result since uh, by the United States, by the European Union, but not by China, rather famously. In the intervening period between 2014 and 2016, uh, China and Russia signed uh, agreements on oil, Russian oil sales to China, perhaps as a uh, counterbalance to uh, American power. Um, in 2011, the United States began a pivot, a repivot, um, to Asia. Uh, from Europe um, to counter Chinese uh, power in, um, in the China Sea, South China Sea. In 2016, of course, we elected a new president here in the United States, which has further thrown into question this trilateral relationship that Mr. Nixon, President Nixon, was obviously concerned about um, and very prescient about. So my first question to get our conversation rolling to our, our panelists is what is the state of this trilateral 
relationship uh, in almost August of 2017. Are we heading toward conflict? Um, is conflict inevitable among uh, these three powers, or is an alliance of two against one ine inevitable? Um, or is it possible that we might be able to actually cooperate with either China or Russia? Um, there are issues that should unite all three powers, uh, North Korea being one and its acquisition of nuclear weapons, yet it doesn't seem as though that has happened. So I'd like you all to comment, if you can, on the state of the trilateral relationship now. Tom, should we start with you? Sure. Let me first thank Jonathan and the other organizers. Thank Mr. Nixon for, for coming, and all of you for your interest in the program this evening. Uh, let me approach the question that Catherine asked by posing one for all of us to think about which is the extent to which the strategic insight that President Nixon had and acted on uh, in the late 1960s was essentially a one shot, reap tremendous advantage from complicating Moscow's strategic calculus by opening up the relationship with China or is one that had continuing consequences for the way in which the countries I interacted. I think it was mostly a front end loaded. Uh, the US reaped very, very substantial benefits uh, from that relationship. Narrowing my answer to China, it was very useful to China's leaders to be able to pretend that they could use the strategic relationship to counterbalance the United States as China entered into its reform and opening program and accepted a high degree of dependence on the United States and the US-led liberal international order. It was very useful for domestic political reasons to be able to say we can counterbalance the Americans with first the Soviets and now the Russians. I think then and now are quite different. I think both Russia and China have far more at stake in their relationship with the United States than they do with one another. The area in which I see them having the greatest congruence of issues is in the United Nations, in the Security Council where both of them have a statutory seat and their desire to have issues in the United Nations. But I don't think there's a lot for Americans to worry about in terms of a two against one alignment in which we are the odd man out. First, let me add my thanks to uh, Jonathan for uh, inviting us here this evening, uh, to Mr. Nixon for being here, and to all of you for uh, coming to the panel. Uh, let me pick up at exactly the point that Tom finished about, um, he said the US shouldn't be too worried uh, if um, the Russia and China had good, good relations. Um, and I think the first point to make is Russia and China probably have better relations now than at any point since um, 1972 when President Nixon made that uh, remark. In fact, uh, in 1969, the Soviet Union and China had very nearly come to war uh, over, uh, partly over border disputes, um, but also rather deeper ideological uh, divisions. I, I spent the morning here working in the archive looking at documents relating to uh, the U.S. policy towards the Sino-Soviet conflict of 1969. And of course it was very difficult to know how dangerous the situation was, but we do know at the time, but we do know um, uh, from uh, subsequent testimony that in fact uh, 
the Chinese leadership was very worried about the possibility of a Soviet attack. And so I think President Nixon's move to draw, uh, first of all, in the short term, to use uh, relations with China as an instrument of pressure on the Soviet Union, as I agree with Tom, that worked. Uh, and in the longer term, it was a very wise decision because his argument was uh, when 15 years when China is a very powerful and important country, we have to have lines of communication open to it. And I think that was the uh, extremely uh, important uh, element in, um, uh, in the policy. So if we look from there to the present, we see, as I mentioned, Russian relations with China much closer than at any point since um, 1969, 1972. And in fact, earlier this month, before the G20 meeting in Hamburg, there was a separate meeting in Moscow where the Chinese leader, Xi Jinping, spent two days uh, in talks with um, uh, Vladimir Putin. And they did make that comment that Russian-Chinese relations were better than they had, really, than they had ever been. Um, and um, the question is, what is the nature of that relationship, and is it uh, harmful to um, the United States? Um, so let me not, not go on too long, but I think the nature of the relationship is that uh, for Russia, China has become an important uh, market for energy and for arms. Uh, it's also a big and important neighbor with uh, whom it's, uh, from, from a Russian point of view, it's certainly in Russian interest to have uh, good relations with, with China uh, and not to get into situations of, of conflict which might threaten war. Um, but it's also in many ways um, a, a default uh, relationship. Russia is much weaker than China economically, not militarily, not in terms of nuclear weapons, but economically certainly much weaker. And its relations with the West are really in a terrible state, um, partly, uh, uh, mainly as a result of Russia's own policy in Crimea and in Ukraine. And I think that um, from a Russian point of view, this isn't an entirely satisfactory uh, situation. They would like to have good relations with the West and good relations with China. It's not a matter of saying, oh, yes, in the early post-Soviet years, we wanted to be strategic partners with the United States. That's not worked out. Now let's be strategic partners with China. I think they would like uh, not to be forced into a relationship uh, which is really, I think, a somewhat subordinate relationship uh, to China. Great, thank you. Carl, do you want to talk about China? Um, first, thank you again, Jonathan, and the uh, Nixon uh, Library, and thank you, Mr. Nixon, for uh, being with us this evening. So perhaps three points to, to go back to the tape from President Nixon. Uh, as we talk tonight about this triangle or relationship between Russia and China and the United States, important to look back in history, even as we talk about partnerships and alliances today, and remember that uh, we can often get it quite wrong, and we have gotten it quite wrong. So President Nixon in 1972 had the wisdom and the strategic courage to go to Beijing. But it was evident to many scholars, and I think many in the intelligence community in the 1950s, that there already was an opportunity at that point, as China and the Soviet Union at that time were having very sharp differences, which were just missed until the 1960s. Indeed, the United States relationship with China through the 1980s, uh, there was a kind of um, romantic notion of this relationship with China, which the United States has periodically had through its history from the, 17, the late uh, uh, 1700s when we began to trade with China in the World War II period, and then these wild swings from, the, from World War II to communism to the Korean War. 
So with the opening of China, then a more romantic view of China, which was not sustainable, and indeed it was not at all sustained as the events of Tiananmen, and then the strategic rationale for the relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States disappeared with the collapse of the Soviet Union. The second point is that the diffusion of global power that is ongoing today, so we talk about the rise of China properly, but there's a rise of India, there's a rise of many others, and on a relative basis, certainly Europe is going down. We can have about a debate about the United States in a relative basis. So any talk today about the triangular relationship also needs to come to grips with this triangle is in a greater strategic context, and it's not just the three of us. Um, it's a lot uh, more than that. And then the third point is with regard to the relations between the United States, Russia, China today. And here I would have a different take uh, than my colleague Tom Finger, where I do have perhaps more concerns than, have been, uh, than he had expressed, and maybe we can have a conversation about this uh, this evening. So clearly, Russia and China, the strategic relationship has evolved since the 1990s, and there it was called the axis of convenience and now it's a strategic partnership, and there's real security cooperation going on. There's arms sales from Russia to China that continue. There's military to military dialogues. There's military joint exercises. I don't want to overstate that, but there is an idea about trying to cooperate globally to preclude the United States from gaining global hegemony, trying to push back. Now, as that translates out, they have their own differences about how you should operationalize that, so to speak, in different parts of the world. But something that I think is understated, and I'll finish here, is that I do believe that there's an ideological component to this relationship, at least between Mr. Xi Jinping and Mr. Vladimir Putin. They are both tough autocrats, and both of them, whether it's Vladimir Putin looking at Maidan in Ukraine, or whether it's Xi Jinping looking at democracy in Hong Kong, they find a comfort in each other in terms of looking at the United States as potentially undermining with democratic subversion their grips on power. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I like that there's some disagreements so we can mix it up a little bit. Um, I wanna get back to this issue of the trilateral relationship and whether we're in a, a multipolar world now or a uni, unipolar world. Um, in the Cold War era, uh, we were obviously always thought of ourselves in a bipolar world, and, and so Mr. Nixon, President Nixon's uh, introduction of China into the relationship were prescience to see that China would be important uh, globally in, in a few decades. Um, it is interesting to think about when he really made that decision in the context of a bipolar world and distribution of um, global power and authority between the Soviet Union and the United States. So here we are in 2017, and um, I'll, uh, when I uh, was recently teaching a course, I guess last spring, um, I mentioned to some international policy students at Stanford um, that uh, I thought we were in a uh, unipolar world. Sometimes I do these things to try to trigger a reaction. And the reaction was, what? Uh, these are, mo the half of our students are, are foreign students in this particular program. And, and their perspective was, no, we're in a multipolar world. The United States is not as powerful as it once was. Um, I happen to be working on a book now on Russia's resurgence and how we understand power, and so I was a little bit sympathetic to that argument. But another argument was that China is now overtaking the United States in terms of um, its percentage of uh, the global economy. Um, and uh, Russia stayed relatively flat, around 3% of the global economy. I think China is now up around 26%. The United States is about 19% of the global economy. So that's not, that's not per capita GDP, where the United States is still a leader, um, but China is, is, has long been said, is on the rise, although maybe stable uh, or, or um, cresting now. Um, is the United States still much more powerful than these two countries 
what does power mean um, in 2017 um, when you know Russia is a, a much poorer country, spends less on its military, um, is very dependent on oil revenues for uh, its budget, and yet what we're talking about now in the United States is how it was able to quote shake the foundations of American democracy by allegedly hacking into um, uh, the Democratic National Committee and possibly even into uh, local um, uh, electoral offices. So what, what kind of world are we in? Is it now multipolar? Uh, are these the three big powers that we should be thinking of and, and watching? And are these, is this trilateral relationship particularly important um, now? Or is the US, on the other hand, still the preeminent power? David, you're looking at me, so I'll okay. have you start. Yeah, you made the mistake of making eye contact. <laughs> I won't make it again. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, I think this actually is uh, an absolutely key question. What kind of world are we living in? Do, are we seeing the formation of some kind of new international system, and, and what will it look like if and when it emerges? Uh, there's a huge amount of commentary and discussion on this. I'm not sure what the new system will look like, uh, but I think we're not in the old system. Uh, it's not bipolar. It's not, the, I think, the unipolar moment um, that was invoked after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, it is, um, if not quite multipolar, I think, uh, trending in that direction. Um, in their meeting in early this month, uh, Putin and Xi called for a multipolar uh, system and I think it, the fact that they're calling for it means we're not we're not quite there at least to their satisfaction the second thing is that yes we can talk about the triangle and I think the triangle is triangular relationship is important but yes India is uh, potentially uh, an enormously important power in, in the coming decades um, the European Union at, at the moment is economically powerful, but very inward looking, trying to cope with its own problems, and therefore not, I think, uh, a, ma a major force um, internationally. Uh, Japan is also preoccupied with its problems. But I think we're seeing a world where we shouldn't, and I agree with Carl on this, we shouldn't focus just on the three, three the, the, this triangle. It's a broader picture, that's one thing. The second thing is that um, we're still, tr so the first thing is it's not the bipolar or indeed the unipolar world. Secondly, we have a changing cast of characters in terms of the states that matter. And the third thing is that I think when we think of China today, it's not China in 1969. When we think of the Russia today, it's not Russia of 1970. I um, mean, these are much more open societies. Yes, they're authoritarian. But nevertheless, uh, technology has made an enormous uh, change, uh, information technology um, access. So um, in Russia, it, it's not today like the Brezhnev years, when it was very difficult to find out information about what was going on outside the Soviet Union. Now everyone has access to the internet, or actually it's very high internet uh, use in, in Russia. Um, also in, in China, and yes, there are uh, sites that are blocked, more so in China than in Russia, uh, as I understand. But nevertheless, clever people find ways uh, 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 around those. So I think even the category of a state and the kind of control a state can exercise, that's being challenged by technologies. And that's another factor, I think, of, of great uh, in importance. So I think uh, one other thing is that uh, whether this President Trump is a symptom or um, a cause uh, of a shift in American thinking about um, world order, at least some of his statements have called into doubt uh, two of the very important pillars on which the liberal order that the US largely created after World War II depended, namely alliances. I mean, questions about NATO or the commitment to South Korea and Japan. I know they're reversed, but nevertheless, there's a, an issue has been raised. Or um, multilateral trade agreements, which are also an extremely important part of, of um, American policy. Now, we don't know 
will there be a reaction to this? Is this a symptom of a longer term change? Of course, that's always the question when you're in middle, the middle of change is you don't know, you know what's transitory or what's, what's, what's long term. But I think those are issues that we have to confront. Uh, and um, I think that uh, then the question is, say for US policy or for Russian or Chinese policy is what kind of world order uh, do we want? What kinds of relationships would we like to have with China in 10 years' time or with Russia in 10 years' time? What would be most advantageous, say, to the United States? Uh, or each country has to think in that sense of its own, its own interests. What degrees of cooperation are important? Uh, what degrees is, is are, are we headed for protectionism, which I doubt we're heading for in a very serious way, but nevertheless, these issues are raised. And I think uh, to uh, decide on one's own position on these questions, one has to have some sense of what would be uh, a, an acceptable or more than acceptable world order to foresee, let's say in 15 years. So President Nixon is looking 15 years ahead. Can we look 15 years ahead? Great question. Carl, do you want to look 15 years ahead? Um, well, the question about Russia and China and the United States just assessing the, uh, the relations now um, through different, through different uh, indicators. In the area of defense military, you had given some metrics on economy. So the United States spends, with its defense budget, 40% of the world's total on military spending. United States of America. China's number two, and it's about 15% of global spending, but coming up steadily. Uh, Russia's number three. Now, just military spending is not the sole indicator. Very important is what is that money being spent on in what context for what kind of contingencies. So it's true that in the case of uh, Russia, we do have uh, very sharp differences that are of security concern, and those are mostly on Russia's periphery. So in Eastern Europe, to an extent in the Caucasus, it has historical interest in Syria and the Middle East, and Putin's playing that out. And it's simply because of the expanse of Russian territory that as Russia looks at all its border areas, it, I guess in a sense it's global in its security concerns. In the case of China, China in terms of the way it looks at its security is primarily a Asian power at this point, starting to get global interest, but primarily in Asia concerned with the Korean Peninsula as we are and with its maritime claims in the Western Pacific. In the United States, we're truly a global power in every sense. In this domain of security though, globally, as I talked about who is spending what on defense, of the top 10 defense spenders, well, you have China and Russia, two and three, but the other 10 led by the United States are either allies of the United States or they're close partners and friends of the United States. Second point on the economy, and, and Catherine had led with that, and so it, the United States and China together we're about 40% of the world's GDP right now. And if you look at global trade and investment, although the Chinese are moving ahead in trade, between the two of us, still pretty dominant. Russia is number eight in the world in its GDP. So as in a way during the Cold War, where we concentrated on its secure, uh, we concentrated on its military and on security issues, like the Soviet Union, it's playing a very weak economic hand. The third point would be on then our soft power that we have to uh, bring to bear. And the United States still today with all of our difficulties that we're facing still is a pretty inspirational model. There is no inspirational Chinese model. Some talk about a development model, but no one embraces a Chinese political model. And the same of course is true for Russia. So I think at times, especially as we're having difficulties at this moment in our history, that we can 
tend to start to take stock of our fears and not recognize still today how strong that soft power is if the United States still wants to show the leadership to continue to try to manage the remarkable set of economic and diplomatic institutions it put in place at the end of World War II. I had a trip to Singapore several years ago and I met with a very good Singaporean diplomat named Tommy Koh, who Tom Finger knows well. And I was talking to Tommy about the United States in Asia worry about competing with China. He said, what's your advice? And betraying my military background, I thought that Tommy Koh would, be, would say, well, Carl, you need to get three more aircraft carriers out here. And Tommy said, Carl, you need to get the New York Philharmonic Orchestra here. <laughs> and that was his point entirely. Deploy the New York Philharmonic op, uh, Orchestra. That representing what is very good about the United States in terms of who we are as a people and these institutions which we've established. Okay, Tom, do you want to comment on this quickly? And I want to get back to some of these I, I do. I think too. I'd like to both address the question you posed and build on what uh, Carl and David have, have said. Because I think these are important points. And I'll be more underscoring than, than certainly challenging. What kind of a world is it that it is, is certainly not bipolar, that sometimes it's multipolar, it depends on what the issue is, it depends on what the relevant questions are, sometimes there are no polls, this is sort of nobody's in charge, it's a free-for-all. But to pick up on points of, uh, that Carl is, is making, if, if we think of a poll as the uh, organizing center about which other countries align themselves and group, that militarily the U.S. alliance system has n n no equal, nothing even close. China has one ally, formal ally, that's North Korea. Doesn't add much to China's national power. Russia has, I think, only Syria. Uh, if that qualifies a, as an ally. But Carl's point is we're going to think about military power and the uses of the elements of national power related to the military, which are not just fighting ability, the amount of transparency, of interoperability, connectivity, integration that is necessary to undergird these alliances that are terribly important to political integration, to economic integration. A second type, of course, is economic integration. That back in President Nixon's day, it truly was a bipolar world. You were in the free world and the liberal order, or you were in the Soviet socialist order of technology transfer, investment, economic, integration, or you were in the very large category of the non-aligned states that kind of floundered with a pox on both of your houses that want to join in. Now there's one game in town, and that is the liberal order that is the extension of what was the free world order. And almost all countries participate in it, almost all benefit from it. It is a rules-based order, not an ideologically based order. And the interconnections and overlapping relationships are very, very numerous. And the third is Carl is soft power, the power to attract. And I'll simply assert uh, to underscore, the US still has enormous soft power. People would like to be sort of like us. They'd like to have their political act together perhaps better than we do now. But the total package of individual freedoms, civil rights, human rights protections, political participation, economic prosperity, military strength, who would you like to be like? You'd like to be like the United States more than you'd like to be like China or Russia. So there's not much positive appeal there. The importance of economic ties that 
China remains enormously dependent on the United States and on the United States allies for its sustained economic growth. China is the largest trading partner of most countries in the world. That point is often made, seldom made is the relevant next point. Most of that trade is in the form of intermediate goods that go to China for final assembly to be put in a box to go to the United North America, Japan, and Europe. Which way do dependencies go? 25% of China's exports come to the United States. 40% of China's exports go to the United States, Japan, and South Korea. 80% of China's exports go to those three countries plus the European Union. 7% of US exports go to China. That's a very, very disproportionate kind of interdependence. And for China and for, for Russia, they can't do much for one another. Uh, that would really accelerate, sustain, step function, transform their economic strength, their ability to bring prosperity, their ability to fundamentally change their military capabilities. They both need factors, relationships available in the West uh, more broadly. Do each of Russia and China seek to gain some opportunities and advantages by dangling, will become closer friends with one another? Of course they do. Um, we don't have to fall for that. Uh, look at the hard numbers. I would disagree with Catherine. It's a different set of numbers. I think yours are based on PPP kind of numbers that the World Bank numbers show the U.S. share of the world economy is still around 24%. That's down a whopping 2% since 1979, when China began its fabulous rise. So we've dropped 2%. China's share of world economy by the World Bank numbers is about 17%, which is almost exactly the same as China's share of world population. The U.S. 24% of world economic product is achieved with 4.5% of the world's population. Measured with those kind of indicators, the gap is widening. Okay, yeah, so I'm, I, when he says PPP, everyone knows purchasing power parity. So if you went and bought a basket of goods um, in China and Russia, it's trying to compare how much those would cost, relatively speaking. So, so yes, I was using purchasing power parity numbers, not gross domestic, gross, gross domestic product numbers. Um, but, um, you know, undeniably, China is on the rise and the worry, and certainly, I think, part, uh, we, part of the explanation one often hears for the rise of um, Mr. Trump and populism here in the United States is a concern that we don't make anything in the United States anymore um, and um, that we've lost manufacturing and instead this is this is being outsourced um, to places uh, like like China but also um, to um, other countries in Southeast Asia that maybe produce things more more cheaply than we can here in the U United States so that's a concern I also wanted to ask get at this issue about soft power um, that that Carl raised, which is the power to attract as opposed to um, force, right, and hard power and, and military power. So when we think about the rise of China, um, if, if there is a rise, and uh, we think about uh, a resurgence of Russia and certainly a more aggressive foreign policy, um, I want to raise the issue that perhaps, actually, uh, that Russia has more allies in China, but Russia in particular has more allies than you mentioned. Um, so Turkey could be one, another uh, budding autocracy. Syria, you mentioned, not exactly a winner, but uh, for Russia it's important um, because it is reinserting uh, interests in the Middle East um, and uh, a concern that the United States was running roughshod and, in Mr. Putin's words, basically messing up, making a mess uh, of the Middle East. 
Uh, Iran, Russia is uh, now uh, anxious to sell even more arms to Iran than it has in the past. Um, Brazil, uh, that is one of the few countries that Russia has no visa regime with. Um, Russia also, and Mr. Putin has more recently, presented Russia as a conservative populist alternative to hedonistic, as he would call it, gay Europe. Um, it is anti-liberal, and proudly so, and there is a certain pull uh, to that um, in countries like, for example, Turkey, or at least the government of Turkey. Um, it also has uh, developed relatively sophisticated methods, as I think we've felt here in the United States, uh, on, uh, of soft power in terms of you know, inserting the opinions of the Russian government into our own political discourse. I'm always surprised because I actually watch Russia Today, which is RT. If you've ever watched RT, you may not know that that's RT, Russia Today. Um, by the way, the Ukrainians, as a sort of funny aside, um, started a, their own network called Ukraine Tomorrow um, in reaction to Russia Today and what they were saying about Ukraine. But um, they uh, present, a, um, in some ways, a, a subtle, but in some ways very slick, in other ways very slick alternative to a U.S. Western liberal perspective on the world, and this is broadcast globally. You can, if you're in Dubai in a hotel, you'll see RT. You can see it actually uh, in, probably in your local cable, cable package here. Um, there are also, you know, news and information trolls. I have had the pleasure of being trolled on Twitter um, by, uh, by Russian trolls. Um, cyber hacking, uh, some people, one person of importance in particular is very doubtful that the Russians have this capability of cyber hacking and his friend Mr. Putin told him they don't. And if they did, they'd never be caught. Um, so um, there's also this other sort of pull of order versus the chaos of Europe and migration and two open societies. So, you know, one could argue that there is this soft power component that Russia has that in a way the Soviet Union didn't. Um, you know, the Soviet Union um, the, the, the dispute in a bipolar world between the Soviet Union and the United States was really one of communism versus capitalism. And that's not exactly the dispute now. It's one of conservatism and order um, versus uh, liberalism run amok uh, and disorder. So I wonder about that. Um, I wonder if you're worried about that and whether um, it makes a difference that these are autocracies, um, whether, the, whether Russia and China are the same kinds of authoritarian governments, um, and the United States is still, um, you know, the, shi the shining light on the hill that it once was, or is international, the United States' international presence um, the same, d does it have the same power, do we have the same pull uh, as we had perhaps in the 1970s and 1980s anymore? Carl, you made eye contact briefly. <laughs> <laughs> he looked at me sideways. My eyes covered. <laughs> <laughs> all, next time we do this, y'all wear sunglasses. Uh, well, a couple of points. Uh, first of all, with regard to Russia and its uh, its uh, friends and its appeal, I, I hesitate sitting between two very distinguished Russia experts. But uh, the history of Russia would uh, indicate, and today's Russia would indicate, and in how those on its borders, which have long histories with Russia, react to it, that uh, I, I <clears throat> don't believe that uh, it has a lot of appeal. If you look at um, how Eastern Europe is reacting, trying to uh, get NATO to uh, get more involved. Although we have Poland. And we have Hungary, authoritarian rollbacks, arguably, but okay. Right, but not, right. not pushing towards, uh, towards Moscow. If you look at, um, if you look at the uh, Caucasus, um, if you look at uh, Central Asia, uh, Central Asia uh, with their own concerns about Russia. Now, I think getting back to the triangle, if we talk about Russia's security relations, that Central Asia is going to pose a great challenge for the Russia-China relationship because none of the Central Asian republics, the five stands, so to speak, uh, particularly persuaded by the models of either Beijing or Moscow, but certainly 
responding to Chinese investment, which is going into Central Asia in a big way. So if you compare Russia's trade with Central Asia to China's, you compare the levels of investment of Russia and China, it's Moscow's being eclipsed, and that's historically been a sphere of influence. At one time, it was part of the Soviet Union. So I think there's going to be contradictions between Russia and China geopolitically in that region, and never mind the models that they offer. So I tend to be optimistic in looking at the United States and looking at uh, our way of government, looking at the European model and our traditions, and that at the end of the day, uh, the systems that have evolved supported by robust institutions, and our institutions here in the United States are still proving to be robust, that they have much more staying power than the rule of man. So rule of law usually trumps uh, the, maybe that was a bad choice of words. Um, uh, the, rule of, uh, the rule of law usually uh, does uh, prevail. I think for the United States, though, that uh, we can't uh, have our head in the sand. So as we look at China right now, do we say smugly, that's a, a system that's uh, doomed to uh, fail? Well, people for about 30, 40 years now have been saying consistently, China's going to run out of steam politically, economically, there's too many contradictions. And still today, it's doing well. So for the United States, whether we look at Russia or China, I think that getting our political house in order is important, but it goes beyond that too. So if I go to China, to most of their airports, their airports look much better than our airports. Uh, if I am on a Chinese high-speed rail, I'd much rather be on that high-speed rail going from Beijing to Shanghai in terms of comfort and indeed safety than I would like to be on an Amtrak train rolling from Washington, D.C. to my home in Raleigh, North Carolina. If I look at education in the United States, we've got some severe problems, and we don't have a monopoly on doing it right. There's things that are going on in China, probably for that matter in Russia, which I don't know well, that are things that uh, we should perhaps emulate. When I look at how much money China is putting into research and development and focusing, I worry about that too. So I think it's, a, it, in my view, it's a, uh, it's a dual problem here. It's a problem politically, but if we can get the House back in order, great confidence. But part of that political will also has to be in getting our House in order, prioritizing what needs to be done so our sons and daughters and our grandchildren are going to have the basic infrastructure and capability in this nation to take then the advantage of these wonderful political institutions and carry forward. Okay, thank you. David? I, I think the um, argument about uh, soft power uh, is true. American culture, uh, the American experience and example has had an enormous influence around the world. And Russia does try to ex exploit soft power in terms of religion, in terms of art, and so on. But it doesn't stretch uh, nearly as far as U.S. popular culture does. Um, on the other hand, I am somewhat surprised by the, um, maybe I shouldn't be, by the number of uh, political rulers who seem to admire Putin. I don't get it myself, but, um, you know, yes, he's a strong man, a strong leader, and, um, you know, he, he seems to be in control of things. And there are lots of states where actually that's an issue. Um, you know, what kind of control does the government have? Uh, what are, the, um, um, what are the, up, the barriers to the emergence of dictators? And they may say, well, here we have an example. You know, uh, success, uh, a successful ruler who's pulled Russia, I mean, this, I'm going to um, criticize this version in a minute, but who's pulled Russia out of the kind of chaos of the 1990s to introduce stability, uh, reassert Russia's place in the world, and so on. But um, it, it's, and so there are ideological differences, and Catherine mentioned the kind of Russian critique of, of Europe as totally decadent, uh, permitting gay marriage and things like that. That's certainly there as an element. In, in Russian culture. But it's not, um, 
offering the kind of alternative it did uh, in the Cold War, where you know central planning was going to be the answer to uh, economic growth and a kind of equitable distribution of, uh, of goods and of standards of living. In fact, um, a few months ago, a uh, former finance minister in the Russian government, a man who's close to Putin, Alexei Krud Kudrov, uh, Kudrin, um, actually um, gave an absolutely scorching, devast devastating analysis of the state, uh, not only of the Russian economy, but of the Russian state. He said, we now have, we seem to be going at, uh, growing at an economic rate of maybe 2%, that's what we can look forward to. And we can't blame sanctions, and we can't blame external things. It's all to do with us ourselves. Uh, the failures uh, of institutions, uh, the failures of structure, the totally inadequate uh, uh, state administration, uh, the fact that people are not, civil society is not allowed to take uh, any kind of initiative. I mean, absolutely scathing criticism uh, of the existing order in Russia. It's not saying, oh, we'd be fine if only the sanctions were listed and so on. So, um, and what he's offering is not some uh, panacea based on different principles. It's offering uh, or recommending good management of a, you know, a market-based uh, society in which entrepreneurship is allowed to play an appropriate role. I mean, it's very striking that when Russians um, who want to set up businesses go to Israel or come to California, they do extremely well, um, but not in Russia, um, where the conditions are, are very difficult. So I don't think we're not on an ide ideological uh, conflict, except maybe around authoritarianism, whether authoritarian governments can do more than democratic governments, but I don't think Russia is a good example for that because it's not carrying through the reforms uh, that, that uh, most economists would say are desperately needed. Um, when you look at Russian arguments about international politics, it's all about geopolitics. It's all a kind of a realist view. and. Um, there's a whole critique developed uh, by Putin about uh, the West, in particular, taking advantage of Russia's weakness after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, and of course NATO enlargement being part of that. But also, democratic values are seen as a threat. So um, the color revolutions in, in Georgia and in uh, Ukraine uh, are seen as extremely um, dangerous uh, for Russia. I remember after the Ukrainian, uh, the Orange Revolution, I was, went to Moscow on a visit and a friend of mine said, oh yes, this is your trial run uh, for Russia. You know, you've done it in Ukraine, now you're going to do it in Russia. And that's an extremely dangerous uh, mentality, I think. So I think there are elements, and just to talk about Russia at the moment, that are rather dangerous, or, or at least present real problems for, for Russian neighbors, in particular for the West. One is the notion that Russia really is a great power. Russia cannot be Russia unless it's a great power. And I remember in the 1990s, uh, very often hearing Russians say to me, oh, we're very weak now, but Russia is condemned to be a great power. Uh, and uh, the second is this sense of the fragility of the social basis uh, of the order that that might be threatened by democratic ideas. And I think uh, in China, I don't know, uh, ask my colleagues, how far that's seen as a threat, but there's certainly a move against Western ideas coming in. And I think, uh, if I may mention one more point, we talk about the collapse of the Soviet Union, and we think, oh, collapse of the Soviet Union, to totally natural process. Of course, people will choose freedom. But the way it's regarded in, in, in Russia, or I think in China, is to take it very seriously, especially in China, because that has relevance to our regime. What was it that caused the Soviet Union to collapse? And I think the um, conclusion that's been drawn is um, weak leadership and the dangers of trying 
to begin to reform uh, a, a, syst a, a kind of an authoritarian system or a system that's in, in, in power. And that makes the prospect of reform politically extremely difficult because it's seen to raise uh, enormous um, dangers for the system. Okay, thanks. Uh, Tom, I, I don't want to take away your opportunity to comment on this, but I also want to just touch on the issue of military strategic um, balance and um, areas of cooperation possibly among these three relatively different powers. Um, and I, But my other point is I see Jonathan coasting around with a microphone and I'm anxious to get some questions from the audience as well. So I think maybe we'll let Tom make his, his comments on what's been said and, and if you can also just comment briefly on areas of cooperation and then we'll open to the audience uh, in our remaining 15 or 20 minutes or so. So, Tom. Um, I'm going to try and tie together some of the themes um, from the discussion thus far. One is to underscore that the world is very different than when President Nixon made the remarks that were played at the beginning. Today's world is not a bipolar world. And among the, the consequences of that is we still have old thinking that I call the seesaw view of international relations. If somebody's rising, somebody else must be going down. That's not clearly, it's, it's clear that's not what's going on. We've got multiple countries doing much better. Um, that doing better in some areas than other areas. We have friends, we don't really have enemies. We have competitors, we have partners, we have frenemies, that it's a very much muddled. The model or the structure of the international system is different. We're in transition from something that was to something that is undefined. We don't have a consensus in our own country about what the future order ought to look like, what our role ought to be in that system, what role we would like other countries to play in that system, how we might help to shape that future. And that makes it very difficult to have the kind of strategic vision, derivative policies that uh, are very well represented in President Nixon's opening to China as a way of complicating Soviet cal calculus. So we run into a trap when we use concepts and terminology from yesterday to talk about the world of today and tomorrow. That the US, in my judgment, clearly does not have the influence, the soft power, the attraction that we once did. That's our fault. That's not the fault of somebody else. It doesn't mean that somebody else has got more attraction than we do. It reflects the somewhat chaotic, certainly ill-defined structure of the international system. And within that still in Kuwait, still forming, still in transition from what we had to what comes next, shame on us if we are so complacent that we don't take an activist role. Shame on us if we don't seek to take advantage of opportunities to collaborate, which are many, that we don't address the points of friction become, before they become uh, more serious tensions or possible military uh, clashes, that there's, in my judgment, nothing about the current structure of the international order, as screwed up as it is, or as uncertain as it is, or having nobody in charge on many issues uh, as it is, that dooms us to conflict with China or with Russia, dooms Russia to conflict with China. We have enormously more areas of congruent interests in cooperation with China, then we have areas of conflict. We have far fewer with Russia. One could talk about the reason, but the possibilities are greater. And it's, it's as was a point made by David, it's a good thing 
that China and Russia have better relations than they've had in a long time. That is a stabilizing, not destabilizing factor. Okay, great, thank you. Um, in fact, one of our colleagues has, has uh, written a book called um, Doomed to Cooperate about uh, Russia and the United States uh, with respect to nuclear power. So, Jonathan, I know you have the microphone open there. Sure. Shall we? Thank you very much. Um, sure. We'll take a couple of questions from the audience. I'd like to first start off by asking, um, we have three pretty big personalities in the U.S., China, and Russia, the U.S. being Donald Trump, China being uh, Xi Jinping, and Russia being Vladimir Putin. Uh, how do these big personalities play a role in influencing trilateral, trilateral relations? Who wants to take that? I, I, can, I can start. Why don't I you, think it why don't, this is your turn. Okay, <laughs> wow, thank you, okay. I made eye contact. Um, so I actually think with, I, I will just comment uh, on um, Putin and Trump because I, I, I have um, met Mr. Putin as I think David has and, um, and um, I think this matters to a significant degree. As a uh, cold-hearted social scientist, I was trained to think that personalities don't matter and that states have interests, not friends. Um, but I do, and I do think that's true. We have interests ultimately. Um, but clearly this matters, uh, relationships matter a great deal to uh, the current president of the United States, um, and he wants people to like him, um, and he evidently wants Vladimir Putin to like him. Now why that's the case, I, I don't know, I'm not a psychologist, um, but um, I, uh, this, I think Mr. Putin is intrigued um, but he's also, uh, he, is, he is many things, and we can use um, negative adjectives um, about him. But uh, one thing Mr. Putin is not is stupid. Um, he's very smart, and he's not necessarily strategic, but tactically he's very smart. So um, I, I, I think that he will use um, Mr. Trump's seeming eagerness to be liked um, and to be friends. Uh, to Russia's advantage. Um, Russia, Mr. Putin is always very cognizant of what Russian interests are, and right now Russian interests are getting rid of sanctions. They very much want those sanctions off, even though he, Mr. Putin will insist that they're not making any difference to the Russian economy. They're not helping the Russian economy, and one way that they're not helping is in attracting Western investment, and I think maybe Tom mentioned, or, oh no, sorry, David mentioned that Alexei Kudrin recently pointed out that the best Russia can do in future is grow about 2% a year. And they haven't hit that yet, that are about 0.5% right now for this quarter. So the, the only way Russia is going to grow, save from what has happened in the past, which is a, a huge spike in global oil prices, and that doesn't look likely in the imminent near future, um, is Western investment. Well, with sanctions on, it can't get that investment. And so this is a tremendous problem um, in, in the one to three to five year term. And what, we're, what we will see happen in Russia is in 2018, there will, have to, there will be another presidential election and my guess is Mr. Putin will run even though he's kind of not sure. Um, and he has to win, and, he, and I will predict, go out on a limb that he will, but he has to make it look legitimate, right? So um, in order to make it look legitimate, uh, he has to be the defender of Russian interests, that is, Russian interests against Western hedonism and culture, and therefore he must stop what is going on in Ukraine and, and keep Crimea. Um, but he must also make the economy grow. Um, people cannot eat prestige, right? People cannot eat Crimea, frankly. Um, they, they actually will, will need to see real incomes go up again or his uh, his uh, ability to maintain order and stability in his country and the regime that he has built, which is cronyistic, and so he benefits as to those around him immediately from uh, the state uh, and, and controlling the state, they must perform. So there is some, you know, some domestic politics obviously uh, involved in, in their international um, stance. So I would say the relationship matters. My concern as somebody who watches Russia and Mr. Putin is that we have a political neophyte uh, as our president who um, is, is uh, very confident um, and perhaps overly confident in dealing with Mr. Putin who has been in office for 17 years and quite successfully so and who really knows what his country's interests are. 
and, and uh, knows how to work people. So, um, you know, I, I think that personal relationship matters quite a lot, and I, I think we as Americans have reason to be a little concerned about it, to make sure our country's interests are served. Maybe say a word about uh, the U.S.-China relation, Shep, and that is point number one is it's very clear that Chinese senior leadership, beginning with Xi Jinping, uh, they were hopeful that Donald Trump would win. Uh, Secretary Clinton, Hillary Clinton, was extraordinarily unpopular with the Chinese senior leadership. She was looked at as the architect of America's so-called rebalance to uh, Asia and the same, of course, in, in 2000, right. 2011, 2012. And so I think that they were uh, then happy when they saw what the election results are. Second point would be that Xi Jinping and his team are facing a very consequential uh, five-year party congress this fall. So one of the things that Xi Jinping does not want going into that congress is a frosty or very difficult relationship with the United States. Uh, part of his scorecard is how is he managing that relationship. So is it possible we'll see a different relationship or a different set of policies from Xi Jinping with regard to the United States after what I don't think we'd see an abrupt change, but clearly that's in his mind. Then the third point is with regard to President Trump. Uh, I think that as many world leaders right now, Xi Jinping is looking at President Trump, and they've heard a lot of rhetoric, a lot of policy goals stated, but they're at some point going to start to take stock of how many of those policy statements that he's making and the policy goals that he's trying to set, how many are being realized. And if not many are being realized or none are being realized, then at some point they're going to begin to discount. There's one other aspect of President Trump's administration that everyone here knows. There's not a lot of appointments being made right now. So if you go into the ranks of the Department of State, the Department of Defense, all those departments, Treasury, all those departments that are consequential in really managing the relations, not only with China, but all of our partners around the world, it, Xi Jinping, doesn't micromanage Chinese foreign policy, nor does President Putin Russian policy, nor does President Trump or any president of the United States able to micromanage policy. Broad visions and then the diplomats, the soldiers, the intelligence, those are the ones that go out and take the broad vision and they implement. And right now, the seats are empty. And I think that's a worrisome. And to get back to Xi Jinping, I know he's got a bureaucracy that's telling him that they're just not certain right now what is the policy of the United States. And generally, by this time, they'd have assistant secretaries of state, under secretaries of state that they'd be meeting with. And then the policies of the two presidents, the two countries, would start to take shape. Um, Jonathan, what should we do? Throw it Third back. question in the back row. Uh, President Obama reportedly told President-elect Trump that North Korea would be his single most uh, difficult foreign policy uh, issue in his first term as president. How do you understand how Russia and China, to what extent they're willing to help the United States or understand, or to what extent do the president understand how fraught the Korean issue is with the president and a possible miscalculation? And is it really in their interest ultimately to get a solution that's favorable to the United States or to let it fester with the possibility that things might get out of control? Great question. Tom? Let me take the China piece of it. Uh, North Korea is truly an intractable problem. There are no good options. There are no magic bullet solutions. This is one I worked on from the 80s uh, until last week, that it would be nice to think that China or Russia could solve the problem 
for the world, for the region. It's not possible. Uh, China has more leverage over North Korea than anybody else. That and three bucks will get you a cup of coffee. They don't have enough leverage to produce results. The Chinese worry that in trying to pressure or prod an outcome around the nuclear weapons, around the nature of the regime, around the missile program, has a greater danger of destabilizing than of stabilizing the situation. There is better not to try, or not to try very hard. Try just enough to keep the Americans off your back, uh, but not hard enough to produce a real danger of regime collapse, a danger of uh, use of conventional weapons that can escalate into a nuclear uh, exchange. That the need for cooperation in managing the diplomatic dimensions of this, the human uh, suffering dimensions of this. China, the United States, I believe Russia, have to play a collective role. But at the moment, there is a lack of willingness to talk in specific terms about managing consistent uh, contingencies for fear that word that we are talking to one another about possibilities in North Korea will trigger unwanted events in there. This is a real dilemma that doesn't have an obvious quick fix solution. My bottom line here is for China is we need to talk to the Chinese continuously about North Korea so that there is good understanding of how each of us sees developments, understands what each is doing or not doing and why, but not to have very high expectations. If I could say something about the Russian attitude, um, which has received much less attention than the Chinese, and I think for good reasons. I think Russia, although it has an interest um, has, for example, was much not very active in the, as I understand it, in the six party talks that took place over a number of years. Uh, this is uh, for them a worrying issue, but it's really China, China uh, has the, the kind of major um, role to play in dealing with it. And I think some of the Russian apprehensions about uh, action against North Korea would be the same as the Chinese. So one fear, of course, is uh, destabilization on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, that's one, one aspect. Uh, another, uh, which some of my China specialist friends tell me is more important than we think, is that uh, for China to, as it were, uh, ditch or um, cooperate in moving against North Korea is difficult because that is a, for all the hostility that exists between them, an ally and another communist state. Um, but also, the, uh, and the, this third element, I think, is probably more, is more important for the Russians, is what if indeed there is some kind of collapse of the regime in the North and a unified Korea uh, with some American presence there, a, a unified Korea allied with, with the United States. Now, um, so I think uh, the Russians uh, have tried, not with huge success somehow, to integrate themselves into the economic dynamism of Northeast Asia. But on the security front, they are happy to have, I think, a quiet, they have a good relationship with China. I think they wouldn't want to get out of step with China on the issue of North Korea. So let, let's leave uh, China to deal with it. I think China is the key actor. Um, and Russia, I think if China wanted and the U.S. wanted, Russia would, would play some role. It wouldn't be in their interest, I think, to oppose what the Chinese want, given the current state of relations between Russia and China. Carl. Um, just uh, briefly, so to follow up on what uh, David had said back to the Chinese perspective, so I think whether it's the United States, Russia, China, all agree that 
uh, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula is in each country's interest, global interest. The idea about putting a premium on stability, but the break point yeah, between the United States and China, and I believe Russia as well, is that in the uncertainty then of a collapse of a North Korean regime, chaos, what would follow, then the Chinese worry, and I think the Russian worry, is that the peninsula would be reunified, and it would be reunified on Seoul's terms. So as today, in Seoul, they worry about North Korea. I think a reunified peninsula, they would celebrate for about 24 hours, and then they'd start worrying about China. China's goal is to push back U.S. presence in the Western Pacific over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Not tomorrow, but longer term. And so they worry about the Korean Peninsula, which they've always seen in their vital national interest, as if there should be chaos, if it should then lead to reunification and the United States still an ally of the Republic of Korea. That would be worrisome, and I think it'd be worrisome to the Russians. A final footnote to this is we talk about triangles, uh, probably informed by my two tours of military duty on the, in the uh, Korean Peninsula, is that as we talk about China, the United States, Russia, Japan, North Korea, never to forget South Korea, because at the end of the day, any U.S. policy is only going to go as far as our democratic uh, Republic of Korea allies want us to go, because they're the ones that live in the neighborhood. We have a question right here. Okay. Uh, getting back to tonight's theme, um, <clears throat> if President Trump um, articulated anything both in the campaign subsequently taking over, I think it's safe to say he wanted a more confrontational approach to China and a controversially a less, perhaps a less confrontational approach to Russia. And earlier this year, I saw on Fahit Zakaria's show, he had on a Russian journalist whose name escapes me, it was clearly a, a Russian, was a Putin surrogate, who said remarkably, I thought, he said he didn't think that would go very far because he thought that the rapprochement with China was so terribly important to Vladimir Putin. So I'd like you to comment on that. And I guess if we, if the President, if President Trump takes the kind of go it alone approach that he's making or America's first, I think it's, I think all of us would agree it was ironic that, I, I think that the Chinese clearly like the current world order. And I think it's ironic that at Davos, which has sort of become symbolic of the world order, what now the keynote speaker was President Xi. Let me just uh, say something about the Russian attitude to uh, President Trump. There was a, a lot of coverage in our, our press about, I think, champagne bottles being popped in the Duma when the election results came in. And I think actually, yes, they were. Uh, pop, but I was uh, in Moscow, uh, not so recently, but uh, in December after the election, and nobody I talked to uh, took that point of view. They said, you know, we're very uncertain. We, yes, he says nice things, but we don't know what that means. And um, one uh, friend who served in the Ministry of Defense said, yes, he's saying these nice things, but he's promising to build up the defense budget by enormous means. So what's this about? What's going on here? So um, what I, and the best, um, uh, the kind of most favorable pro pro prognostication I heard was the one that the television journalists made, namely that yes, uh, we might have a short honeymoon period, uh, but then uh, a lot of issues will emerge. Well, I don't think we've had a short honeymoon period, or at least it's been a very tempestuous honeymoon. Well, it's not a honeymoon at all, actually. <laughs> um, so, um, and I don't, I, I, I think the reasons are complex. It's not just because China is more important to the US, I think, um, but I'm not going to go into all the complicated aspects. I'll add a couple of things on, on China. Um, to, f to frame the issue, uh, one of the things that made our 2016 election unusual uh, was that the business community, which for eight administrations was the strongest 
advocate of stability in U.S.-China relations. That sort of, you can have your rhetoric for elections, but afterwards, this is about money. This is about sunk costs. This is a, but the business community basically sat this out. Business community is not happy with Xi's basically China first policy. Theft of intellectual property, changing the rules again of uh, not according national treatment to investment. Uh, uh, the Made in China 2025 is a, in some ways the mirror image of Made in America for Mr. Trump. Under that, there really are some fundamental issues having to deal with reciprocity. They're global issues because of the approach that the United States has followed since 1947, 48, of accepting unequal trade relationships. Our market's more open than others because it made our partners strong, it made our alliances strong, it made us rich. It was a very smart policy. Uh, but the public clearly says, why are we still doing that? We won the Cold War. Uh, we're not getting richer uh, anymore, the inequitable. Uh, so the demands for reciprocity, including by the business community, make China a legitimate target for U.S. You want to invest in the United States, only those areas that you allow us to invest in. I think we're going to see that, which is different than the kind of campaign examples that Mr. Trump used, but it's going to, to, to be there. That there are things that it's hard for me to imagine Mr. Trump making issues in human rights. Um, the defense of constitutionalism that this does not seem to be high on his agenda, and I'm sure that makes the Chinese happy. Taiwan, I don't think, but despite some developments right uh, after the election, the phone call, I don't see a prospect for changing U.S. policy towards Taiwan or the mainland making that uh, an issue. The, the key here is the economic interdependence and the ability to collaborate on a whole range of transnational issues. Because China, like the United States, is either a part of every problem or must be a part of any solution on climate change, on water, on globalization, on demographic, on urbanization. It goes on and on. So here we really don't have any sensible prospect except to cooperate. I haven't got a clue which way Mr. Trump wants to jump on this. I have a suggestion. <clears throat> Being a, a geologist, and um, most people, because of that, they say I have rocks on my head, <laughs> but I'm hearing the, the idea of axes, of um, centers of rotation, and so on. And if we think about the world, looking at it from a distance, and looking at the centers of, of influence everywhere, you, you're pointing out the three that are most obvious to us all today, but what is it that changes the rotation? What disturbs uh, an axis of rotation and makes it precess? Somebody like a Trump makes a lot of off-the-cuff notes that uh, some people wonder about, but that has an influence. It affects things, and I hope that what you folks, you're so generous with your thoughts, um, I just hope that we can keep old folks uh, like us to uh, keep an eye on it and warn the young youngsters that, look, the rotation is changing and is coming from people we never thought would change it. So read the news and um, keep an eye on it and listen to those who have experience. I'm glad you're here and I'm very appreciative of you being here. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, so my question is more related to long term, not necessarily uh, in with current situation. So besides soft power and financial interdependence, what elements would help the U.S. maintain its allies? So um, what are your thoughts on that? 
Um, who wants to open that up? I have thoughts. <laughs> well, I think, I think Carl pointed at it earlier, which, which is getting our own house in order. That it's very hard to be a shining example for others when we have partisan political paralysis, when we can't seem to address issues from fixing the problems in our healthcare system to an aging infrastructure, to an inadequate education system, to the failure to retrain people who have been displaced by um, automation and uh, movement of jobs to, to some other location. These are fixable problems. We have it within our financial and political capacity to do it. Um, that we need to do it for ourselves. If we do it for ourselves, we go, in my view, a long way towards burnishing our credentials for leadership in the international system, the strength of the, the magnetic appeal of soft power, and have the capacity to provide the kinds of leadership that the world really needs. Now, I have one sentence which comes from Chinese a few years ago. I've been interacting with China for literally since the ping pong initiative that followed President Nixon's trip in 1972. The observation was the United States must continue to lead. We're not ready to lead. Nobody else is ready to lead. If we make a proposal, it's dead on arrival because we make it. You have thick skins. You're used to getting beat up. Our leaders can't afford to propose something that is laughed out of court. We worry about suffering economically, suffering in terms of the limited amount of international influence that we have. If we make a proposal that isn't accepted, or even worse, we launch an initiative that fails. So you have to take advantage of the technological, innovative, economic capacities, as well as the greater political capacity. I agree with that, but the prerequisite is physician heal thyself. Carl. Uh, Two points on this. One, one would be that if there is a diffusion of global power that's underway right now, and indeed there is, I, Tom's point is well taken, though. It gets overstated about how much ground the United States has lost. If you look at percentage of global wealth, the United States over the last 20 years has not lost a lot. But there has been a diffusion that has gone on away from allies and partners to other parts of the world. So one would be given that, and I think that it, it, probably our standing economically in the world over the next 50 years would be one where it may come down further. So that's prioritization then. And the idea that in the 50s or 60s or 70s that we could move anywhere at will and set our priorities as we wished, those days I think are over. So in, when we look at places in Central Asia or parts of the Middle East, parts of the world, uh, should we be more discriminating? And are there other regional powers that have much more vested interest and, would credi and will credibly apply force than the United States? And the second point is with the use of force by the United States of America. So we're gathered here in this uh, library. Uh, the many accomplishments of President Richard Nixon was the establishment of the all-volunteer army and the all-volunteer force. I graduated from West Point in 1973, and the army that I entered was broken, and President Nixon knew this. And the move towards the all-volunteer force was a brilliant move. And, a pres and President Nixon, he lived long enough to see how magnificent our armed forces became. But now I worry that far removed from this all-volunteer force creation in 1972 and 1973. We've had several changes of generations in the United States since that era, and I worry 
about the disconnection of our armed forces with the American people. So to ask you the question that had we had a conscript force, a draft force, would we have gone into Iraq in 2003? And I think a case could be made, maybe not, because a lot of mothers and fathers would have been calling up their congressmen asking, what is this about? Certainly I know that 10 years after 9-11, we would not have had 100,000 troops in Afghanistan, which we did. And the reason for that is, is because it's an all-volunteer force, and mothers and fathers, they don't call because it's all volunteer. And so this breaking of the tissue between the American people and our Congress and our armed forces, I do worry about increasingly. So it's not to say that the volunteer force model was at all a mistake. By no means could we restore a draft, but we do as a nation, we have to start to think through this. How can you, us, do we get more skin in the game the American military so that we don't end up with the phenomena which we have today in which before the all-volunteer force was established and the breakpoint after the all-volunteer force was established, we've had five times per annum the amount of military deployments into combat zones than we did before the volunteer force. And this is something to get back to your question that also needs to be addressed. We need the rejuvenation of America that Tom Finger talks about. We also have to think about our face to the world right now. And I'm afraid that too often, as we go around the world and we do our travels, there's a lot of the world that sees the primary face of the United States, not as Tommy Coe's New York Symphony, but in battle groups, Marines, and aircraft carriers. Thank you, Catherine, to, to our distinguished panel. Please give them a round of applause. Uh, thank you for your enlightening insights. Uh, thank you to our audience. We'll see you at our next event. Thank you so much. Good job, panelists. Good job, moderator.